Hey, Verna, come on. Hurry up. It's time for church. I'm coming. Give me a minute. Good. There she is. Oh, what a glorious day this is. Yes, it's Resurrection Sunday. I really love Easter because of its significance. The victory of life over death, the hope the cross gives us as it reminds us of the dark days of Good Friday and of Saturday when Christ was in the tomb. And I love most that Easter is the day in which we can say to each other, Christ is risen and know that it is true. Jesus came to earth to show us how to live, how to put others first, and how to love and how to give. Then he said about his work that God sent him to do. He took our punishment upon himself. He made us clean and new. He could have saved himself, calling angels from above, but he chose to pay our price for sin. He paid it out of love. Our Lord died on Good Friday, but the cross did not destroy. His resurrection on Easter morn fills our hearts with joy. Now we know our earthly death, like his, is just a rest. We'll be forever with him in heaven where life's the best. So we live our lives for Jesus. Think of him in all we do. Thank you, Savior. Thank you, Lord. Help us love just like you. May your Easter be happy. May your day be bright. May you enjoy the treats and sweet delights. But remember, the true meaning of Easter is the celebration of the resurrection. He lives. He lives. Christ Jesus lives today. Happy Easter, everybody. That's you and you and you. Have a, Have a blessed and happy Easter day. Hippity hoppity. Hop hop. Good morning. Welcome to our online worship service from United Christian Church, Country Club Hills, Illinois, on this glorious Easter morning. My name is Verna Robinson. My name is Al Robinson. You are tuned into our worship service for Easter Sunday, April 4th, 2021. Whether you're a church member, visitor, family member, or friend, we are blessed by your presence and thankful that you've chosen to join us for worship today. Easter greetings. I would not hesitate to say that most of us are familiar with the song Amazing Grace, which has been an integral part of Christian worship for years. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found, was blind, but now I see. While there are many attempts to define grace, one definition that speaks to my heart is God's unmerited favor. We have done nothing to earn it, but the Father extends his grace to humanity in the person and life of his only Son, Jesus Christ. One of the most beloved scriptures in the Bible is John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever so believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Let us pray. Father, help us to embrace and enjoy the life you've given us to live. Every day we awake, you faithfully meet us with purpose. We lift our eyes to you as we seek to embrace your peace. Holy Spirit, Please remind us that we are your children, freed from the chains of our sins by Jesus' sacrifice on the cross. 
resurrection, and ascension to heaven. Bless our minds to remember and embrace the freedom, hope, joy, and peace we have in Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. It was Friday afternoon, and Jesus is dead. His brutalized body hanging without life on a cross dropped into a hole in the dirt. His executioners had dug the holes, prepared the place, and done their job with ruthless efficiency. This wasn't how it was supposed to be. The hope of mankind overcome by powers of hell, by the shadow of a grave. We once knew what it was like to rule and reign on the earth. We were made to live in the light, in relationship, in purpose. We were made for more than what we've come to accept as normal. Ever since the garden, Satan and his kingdom have been tightening their grip. Darkness has ruled evil, chaos, suffering, hopelessness. We've been enslaved and crippled by the holes the enemy has been digging for us too. But instead of killing the Messiah, the cross became a catalyst for salvation. The hole that was dug to hold an instrument of shame and death was instead filled with an instrument to bring healing and new life. That's the way God is. Nothing is impossible with Him. He's always restoring, always renewing, always able to take what was meant for evil and turn it for good, to take our graves and turn them into gardens. Why? Because He never gave up on His plan. He has never given up on us. He knows what we don't, that you can't have resurrection life without death, Jesus. He died so we can have lives of purpose and power over the grave. He is not dead. He is alive. And because he lives, we can live again.
It's prayer time. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we come today thanking you for another day. Another Sunday we can, as a congregation, to worship you and give you thanks. Thanks for many blessings, so many we can't count them all. Thank you for your church, our United Christian Church, for each member, for the love we have for each other. We ask that you be with our pastors, staff, elders, deacons, and shut-ins. Be with our denomination, your larger church. We ask that the vaccines for COVID-19 will be effective and that all who need them will get them. We look forward to the day when we can shake hands, hug each other, and have no need to wear a mask. Father, be with the, uh, President Biden and his team. Keep him safe and help him make the right decisions. We ask that you bless the effort to unite separated children with their parents. Be with those who are working to unite our country. Be with the teachers, the principals, administrators. May they see each other's point of view. Be with those in nursing homes and hospitals and those who care for them, so soon we can visit them face to face. Be with the homeless and those who provide shelter. For those who are jobless and those waiting to hire them. For the hungry and those who provide food. Be with those who have mental illnesses, those who have depression. May they find meaning and value in life. Be with those who harbor hatred May they find the medicine of forgiveness. Father, forgive our sins and shortcomings. Be with us today and the days ahead. Be with James King Sr. and Barbara McCulley, with Christina O., the Powell family, the Graysons, the Rings, and the family of Bonnie Carey Culver. Thank you, Father, for your grace and your unconditional love. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Be blessed. The Easter story begins in such stillness. An early morning, heavy hearts and slow feet. Making their way toward an immovable rock. But... The women arrive at the tomb only to find out that the body and the story they thought it held could not be contained. Death burst forth into life. The resurrection is God's reaching into the world with boundless love to gift us all with new life and a new beginning. Since this story was first told, people have told it boldly. The proclamation, Christ is risen, is met with an affirmation. Christ is risen indeed. This call and response can be heard on Easter morning in communities all around the world. When you say it, in just a moment, imagine the voices echoing this good news back to you. And not just from the corners of your room or sanctuary, but from large cathedrals and remote villages across the globe. In a moment, I'll say, Christ is risen. And you are invited to respond, Christ is risen indeed, with the fullness of your voice and your body. Shake off your own stillness and let us reach to embody the scope of this good news. Reaching high up to the sky, like you're praising God, like you're surrendering to the wonder. Christ is risen. Christ, Christ is, is risen, risen indeed. indeed. Reaching way out to your sides, like you're sharing your love, like you're embracing your neighbor. Christ is risen. Christ, Christ is, is risen, risen indeed. Reaching far out in front of you, like you're being called into the world, called to this very place, in this very moment, to live this good news. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Alleluia. This Easter, 
Let the story of resurrection move you. Let it shake you from stillness. Let it open your imagination and expand your hope. Let it grow your sense of what is possible in your life and in the life of the world. Amen. Christ the Lord is risen today, Alleluia. Songs of men and angels say, Alleluia. Raise your joys and triumphs high, Alleluia. Sing ye heavens and earth reply. Good morning, beloved, and welcome to the Resurrection Sunday Worship Experience here with the United Christian Church. 
I'm James King, senior pastor here at United, and I am so glad that you are joining us in worship this morning. Now, not only are you worshiping with us online, but at this very same moment, we're actually worshiping in our building. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We have taken every precaution to ensure that those folks who, who registered online and reserved their seat, that they're actually able to be in the building and feel comfortable. So, beloved, just know... Temperatures have been taken, folks are wearing masks, um, all that's going on to keep everyone safe. And we want you to know that um, this is a day worth celebrating. That's correct. And one of the things I want to say about that, about our celebration, for many of you, you stuck with us through the 40 days of Lent and you've, you've kept your, your your fast going. And I just want to say to those who who committed with me, you know, hey, I'm going to hang in there, Pastor, I'm going to give it a try. Or you maybe you called and said, you know, Pastor, I fell off. So what do I do now? I'm like, man, we get right back on that thing and not eat any dairy. Um, you know, we, you, we've made it. And today I want to celebrate with you. You have earned your Easter dinner. But um, I'm just so excited. I really am for this Resurrection Sunday because it has been a year ago. We didn't know what we were going to do and where we were going to be. And now here we are. Amen. Amen. Look, I'm not going to be before you long this morning. So I want to begin our time in the sermonic moment by recounting the resurrection of Jesus together. And so I'm going to go to the Gospel of John, chapter 20, verses 1 through 16. I'll be reading from the New Living Translation. And so if you want to read along with me, it'll also appear on your screen. Hear the word of the Lord. Early. On Sunday morning, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and found that the stone had been rolled away from the entrance. She ran and she found Simon Peter and the other disciple whom Jesus loved. That would be John. And she said, they've taken the Lord's body out of the tomb and we don't know where they put him. Peter and the other disciple started out for the tomb. They were both running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He stooped and looked in, and he saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he didn't go in. Then Simon Peter arrived, and he went inside. He also noticed the the grave clothes, the linen wrappings lying there, while the cloth that covered Jesus' head was folded up and lying apart from the other wrappings. Then the disciple who reached the tomb first, he also went in, and he saw and believed. For for until this moment, they still hadn't understood that the scriptures said Jesus must rise from the dead. They went home. But Mary, Mary standing outside the tomb, she was crying. And as she wept, she, she stooped and looked in and she saw two white robed angels, one sitting at the head and the other at the foot of the place where the body of Jesus had been lying. Dear woman, Why are you crying? The angels asked her. Because they've taken away my Lord, she replied, and I don't know where they put him. She turned to leave and she saw someone standing there. It was Jesus, but she didn't recognize him. Dear woman, why are you crying? He asked her. Who are you looking for? She thought he was the gardener. Sir, she said, if you've taken him away, just tell me where you've put him and I will go get him. Mary, Jesus said. She turned to him and she cried out, Rabboni, which is in Hebrew for teacher. Beloved, would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we celebrate the resurrection of our Lord on this day. And we ask even now that you would allow your Holy Spirit to fall fresh on us with resurrection power. Thank you for the way that you've kept us. You've loved us and you've provided for us. And I'm asking even now, Father, that those who would hear these humble words, that they also might hear and believe. So, Father, I step out of this clay vessel and I ask that you would fill me with your Holy Spirit, that those who are under the sound of my voice would only hear Jesus. We give thanks, asking in his precious name. Amen. Amen. But love, you know, to tell you the truth, to preach a resurrection Easter Sunday sermon, it's always been challenging for most preachers, even for me. And, and challenging not because it's, it's, it's a difficult task. It's challenging because this is a story that everybody knows. And it's a story that everybody knows how it ends. 
There's no, no plot twist, no surprises. We know Jesus got up. In fact, in some traditions, it doesn't matter pretty much what you say when you get ready to do your sermon. After you say good morning, you, just, you start out there. It doesn't matter what you say at that point, so long as whatever you put in the middle, you ended with early. Early on Sunday morning, Jesus got up from the grave. He threw off his grave clothes and the angels rolled away the stone. He got up with all power in his hands and death where is your victory and grave? Where is your sting? Aren't you glad about it? And then at this point, the whole church would shout, yes. Uh, it seems probably easier if I just said this morning, good morning, beloved. Today is the day that we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. He got up from the grave and he lives today. He walks with me and he talks with me all along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives? He lives within my heart. Aren't you glad about it? That's the part where all of you will start saying, yes. Uh, but instead, I know that it is important for us to be excited about the resurrection. Because honestly, if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, there'd be no reason for us to celebrate Easter. We wouldn't have the rest of the Bible. In fact, the church itself wouldn't even exist. So just for a few moments... Even though you know how the story ends, I want to ask you a couple of questions and then provide some answers. Why does the resurrection matter? So I'm going to share with you three brief points and I'm going to send you on your way, hopefully with a new found joy. Point number one, why does the resurrection matter? Number one, the resurrection validate Jesus' claims that he is who he says he is. Beloved, people make claims all the time. In fact, you don't need to have any authority at all to make a claim. In fact, there's this guy, he made a claim that he had this new medical breakthrough that's the cure for aging. And, of course, he got arrested for selling snake oil. But when they reviewed his arrest records, they discovered that this man had been arrested four previous times for making the exact same claims. Once in 1749, again in 1890, one more time in 1920, and lastly, he was arrested in 1980. I know you guys are laughing, right? I oh, know, I know, I know, I know, I know. But the thing is, I'm just saying that folks make claims, but, whole, but most folks who make claims don't have enough juice to back them up. Anyone can make a claim, but the resurrection of Jesus validates his claims. Let's think just for a moment. Jesus never claimed to be a great religious leader. He never claimed to be a great plot prophet. He never claimed even to be a man of God, but he did claim to be the son of God. And as you read in the Bible, anytime Jesus makes this claim, folks start flipping out. The reason being is that claiming this title means that he's claiming that he is equal with God, which means that he is God. To the religious leaders of his time, they, they would say that if you say you're the son of God, you saying that you're equal, that you're saying you have the same authority, that you have the same power, that you are a direct descendant of God, that you're part of God's bloodline. This, of course, to them was blasphemy. No one could be equal with God unless you were the son of God. And that is exactly what Jesus claimed. Here are just a few of Jesus' words that accompanied his claim. And in John chapter 11, verses 25 through 26, he's talking to Martha. And he says this, Martha, um, Lazarus' sister. Jesus told her, I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me will live even after dying. Everyone who lives in me and believes in me will never die. Talk about some God authority. And then he says, do you believe this, Martha? Or in John chapter 14, verse 6, Jesus told him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come through the Father except through me. As we ponder all of the things that Jesus did and claimed, we have to ask, who has the power to forgive sin? Well, God does. Who has the power to raise people from the dead? God does. Who has the power to grant eternal life? God does. And beloved, Jesus did all of these things. 
He forgave sin. He raised people from the dead. He told people that they would be with him in heaven. Remember on Good Friday, the thief on the cross? Today you will be with me in paradise. What validates Jesus' claim more than anything? Are these words found in John chapter 10? And I want to read just the first part of verse 18. No one can take my life from me. I sacrifice it voluntarily for I have the authority to lay it down and when I want to and also take it up again. Beloved, Jesus allowed himself to be taken to the hands of men, allowed himself to be crucified, and the Romans made sure he was dead. They pierced him in his side. He was placed in a tomb. Can I invite your sanctified imagination just to read this text with me? Just, just kind of read into this just for a minute. Could it, could it be that when Jesus was placed in the tomb, all the angels in heaven, they were on standby? Are we going to war? Will we go and rescue him? They were waiting for a sign. And in Matthew chapter 28, verse 2, it says this, that, that they were that there was a great earthquake and an angel of the Lord came down and rolled away the stone and then took a seat on it. I just imagine in my own sanctified imagination that at that moment when Jesus said, oh, it's time up for me, from, it's time up for me being in here, that he tore off the grave clothes, he took the napkin, probably threw it down on the ground, and then he walked in, and when his feet touched the ground, the earth shook, and that was a sign for the angel, let me go and get this rock out of here, because Jesus is about to do some things. And Jesus, walking out of the tomb, says, oh, by the way, that thing that was on my face, go in there and fold that up for me. And then he takes his step out of the tomb. The resurrection matters, beloved. It matters because it validates Jesus' claims that he is the son of God, that he is who he says he is. Let me keep going. Point number two, the resurrection matters because your sins can be forgiven. There's a chorus back when the days I spent about 20 years as a youth pastor. And in those days, I used to teach children and young adults a song as a way of helping them to understand the gravity of sin and also the amazing restorative power of grace. The song goes like this. I owed a debt I could not pay. He paid a debt he did not owe. I needed someone to wipe my sins away. And now I sing a brand new song, Amazing Grace. Christ Jesus paid a debt that I could never pay. Romans chapter 6, verse 6 through 8 says it this way. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing. So that we would no longer be enslaved to sin for one who died has been set free from sin. Now, if I have died with Christ, we believe that we also live with him. On the cross, Jesus took the debt and the burden of the sins of the entire world, whether they believe him or not. Jesus took the sin of the world upon himself and paid the debt that we could never pay. Romans chapter 6, 20, 23, verse 23 says this, For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life. In Christ Jesus, our Lord, if Jesus never walked out of that grade, we would still be bound as slaves to sin and we would still be bound to a debt that must be paid to God. But we have a free gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ, don't we? The resurrection matters because now by the receiving of Christ, our sins are forgiven. My last point as I come to a close. The resurrection matters because it reveals the heart of God. Let's look back just a few, ver a few verses that are our focal text this morning. And I want to look back at um, John chapter 20 verses 14 and 16. And I want you to look at this exchange. She turned to leave and she saw someone standing there. It was Jesus, but she didn't recognize him. Dear woman, why are you crying? Jesus asked her. Who are you looking for? She thought he was the gardener. Sir, she said, if you've taken him away, tell me where you've put him and I will go get him. Mary, Jesus said. And she turned to him and she cried out, Rabboni. Mary Magdalene, she was there at the, <coughs> she was there at the cross 
when Jesus was crucified. And she was the first person at the tomb and the first person to see Jesus alive after the resurrection. There, there's little doubt that she loved Jesus as much as any other follower of Christ. Some historians, they say about her, they say that she was this sinful woman, a prostitute. She was the woman who washed Jesus' feet with her tears and dried them with her hair. Scripture tells us in Luke's gospel, chapter 8, verse 3, 1 and 3, 1 through 3, that, that she was the woman whom had seven demons cast out of her. We also know that she was a disciple of Jesus and she traveled along with the other 12. Beloved, what I do know about Mary is that she demonstrates that what Jesus says about those who have experienced forgiveness. In fact, in Luke chapter 7, Jesus says this. He says that when you have been forgiven much, you love much. If Jesus hadn't rose from the grave, scriptures like John three sixteen, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, would mean nothing. Or in Romans chapter 8, verse 35, what can separate us from Christ's love? Well, we just could say simply death could. But Jesus stepping out of the grave and then appearing to his disciples, this is huge because it honestly reveals what God's heart is for us, that we wouldn't be left like orphans. I've recently... Recently had a personal experience with the understanding of the finality of what death means. There is nothing that I wouldn't give if I could have my loved one back. And I have to come to the grips that as much as she loved me, she's not going to be able to come back. But ah, uh, ah, uh, I know you're saying, Pastor, you do feel you should get over this thing. But I'm just saying to you is this is that when it's you Everything becomes different. When there's some big, powerful love in that relationship, everything is different. And that's when you understand that death is the equalizer to all of us but God. Mm. But God in the equation says this is what my love does. That's why I love Psalm 138. Excuse me, it's Psalm 139. It's, 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 it's a song of how God's love pursues us. Let me read a little bit for you. It's in Psalm 139, verses 7 through 12, what I want to read. I can never escape from your spirit. I can never get away from your presence. If I go up to heaven, you are there. If I go down to the grave, you are there. If I ride the wings of the morning, if I dwelt by the farthest oceans, even there your hand will guide me and your strength will support me. I could ask the darkness to hide me and the light around me to become night. But even the darkness, it cannot hide from you. To you, the night shines as bright as day. Darkness and light are the same to you. Beloved, as much as Jesus walked out of the tomb, I want you to know that with him, he brought and revealed to us the love of God that came with him. The love that will, no matter where you go, Jesus and his love is with you. Jesus goes on for 40 days. He comforts Mary in Luke. And, and, and he comforts Mary and in Luke chapter 7. He walks seven miles with two heartbroken followers to a town called Emmaus. In John chapter 20, when the disciples were meeting behind locked doors out of fears for their lives, Jesus shows up in the middle of the room and says, peace, brothers. No, he doesn't say that. He says, peace be unto you. And he lets them check out the wounds in his hands and his feet and his sides. And then, then, then when they tell Thomas who missed out on that visit, then Jesus shows up for Thomas and says, Thomas, you don't have to doubt. Jesus does this eight days later. He says, Thomas, here are my hands. Touch them. My side, put your hand in here. My feet, look at them. And then in John chapter 21, verse 12, Jesus, even while, his, while a handful of disciples are out fishing, Jesus is on the shore cooking breakfast for them and tells them to come have a meal with them. Jesus takes time and he restores Peter after Peter knowingly denied Jesus three times. 
For 40 days, Jesus is everywhere. He's pursuing. He's loving his disciples. He's showing them that God still is God and he loves them. In John chapter 20, verse 30, the the scripture says, The disciples saw Jesus do many other miracles and signs in addition to the ones that are recorded in John's gospel. These are written so that you may continue to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing in him, you will have life by the power of his name. Beloved, if you've ever wondered what God's like, God is love. Love that can't die. Love that raises its own self out of a grave. Love that pursues you your whole life. The love that saved you when you should have lost your life. The love that was with you when you hit rock bottom. The love that wouldn't let you go any lower. The love that was present when that baby was born and changed your world. The love that gave you courage when you didn't think you had it in it. Love came out of that grave. And that love wants to come into your heart. Beloved, on this Resurrection Sunday, on this day. I want to invite you to receive the love that is in Jesus, who has been pursuing you your whole life. Would you pray with me if you want to receive Christ today? Heavenly Father, I thank you for this amazing message and word of life and love and proof that Jesus is all that he says he is and more. I recognize that I owe a debt that I can't pay. And so, Jesus, if you would, Come into my heart. Walk with me and talk with me. Take away my past. Give me a brand new beginning that is sealed with eternity. Thank you for dying on the cross and thank you for a day like today when I can celebrate that you now live. Thank you for giving my sins. Thank you now for making me your son or your daughter. God, I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. My friends, if you have prayed this prayer for the very first time, I want to say to you, happy birthday. You have become a brand new creation. Beloved, if you would want to share with us, share with me that you've made this decision today on this Easter day, your new spiritual birthday, look, just send me a quick text to 708-616-1101 and just In the text message, just type in there, I have decided, or I'm brand new, or I accepted God's love today. Just just send me that text message. I want to reply with you, and I want to send you some some, some scriptures just to have you read on your own to make sure that you remember and know that you are indeed saved, as the scriptures say. And I also want to give you an opportunity to even just walk with you and encourage you as you grow. Beloved, I hope that today is the day that you celebrate the resurrection of our Lord brand new and that you begin to move forward with power and joy. This is the word of God for the people of God. Go out, beloved, and have a love-filled day.
Now let the heavens be joyful, let earth and soul begin. The round world keep my triumph, and all that is therein. Let all things sing and all sing, their notes of goodness blend. For Christ the Lord has risen, our joy that has no Good morning, family. Once again, we have reached the heart of our worship service. Here at the Christian Church Disciples of Christ, we celebrate an open communion each and every Sunday. All who believe that Jesus is the Christ, you're welcome to participate in this act of worship. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread which I shall give for my life of the world is my flesh. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood, abides in me, and I in them. As the living Father has sent me, and I live because of the Father, so he who eats me will live because of me. After the prayers for the elements, we shall commune together. Please pray with me. Dear Creator God, Thank you once again for allowing us to come to this holy table. God, thank you for the greatest act of love ever witnessed. Thank you for giving us your son so we shall be redeemed. God bless this loaf which represents your body given for us. Thank you for the blood which is shed, for it represents the remissions of sin. God, we thank you. God, we love you. And God, we pray this prayer in your Son, our Savior's name, Jesus Christ. Amen. On the night that our Lord and Savior Jesus was betrayed, he gathered in the upper room and his apostles were with him. He said, I earnestly desire to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I shall not eat of it again until it's fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And after he had given thanks, he took bread. He broke it, gave it to his apostles and said, Take eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Shall we eat the bread together? Likewise, Jesus took the cup after supper and said, This cup represents the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you can do it. Do it in remembrance of me. Shall we drink the cup together? Family, we serve a risen Savior whose kingdom has no end. Go forth in the power of the Holy Spirit and remember that God loves you and so do I. God's love go deep when our NBA partner, Tennyson Center,
chose to open their doors wider to vulnerable children. I have seen God's love go deep when working with my immigrant clients. God's love is wide. And at Global Ministries, we see what wide really means. So I see God's love go deep in the coming together of students and faculty and staff, in their openness to challenging conversation, and in the vision of a more just, a more peaceful, a more whole community. The Easter offering reaches deep and wide, developing disciples, forming new faith communities, connecting with ministry partners around the world, and serving the people of God. Your gifts make all the difference. Imagine what God can do and how deep and wide it goes when you support the Easter offering. everyone. I'm Cinnamon Poole and you're watching UCC TV. There will be Bible study this Wednesday, April 7th from 6 o'clock until 7.30 p.m. via Zoom. Be sure to look for your invitation and join us this Wednesday. There will be a virtual board meeting on Saturday, April 17th at 12.30 p.m via Zoom. All board members, please be sure to look for your invitation prior to the meeting. Last but not least, please don't forget how important it is to give. You can give through our two convenient mobile giving apps, Give Plus or Givelify. You can give through our website at www.uccdoc.com or you can mail your offering to United Christian Church at 4351 West 180th Street, Country Club Hills, Illinois, 60478. Continue to stay safe and God bless you all. This is Cinnamon Poole signing off for UCC TV.